that the prosecutor said that they don't have any surrogates, and yet day after day they have a surrogate who comes out here and addresses the media. But um, I'm not going to get into any of the facts of the case except that we, we you know, Mr. Weinstein's one desire is to get to trial as soon as possible. He's been in jail for, he's going into his fifth year for a matter that the highest court of uh, the state, no matter what anybody else says, the, 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 the voices that matter say he got an unfair trial, not only in New York, but in the United States of America. And the knee-jerk reaction of the Senate of the state of New York is disgusting, disgusting that they are putting forth, they have passed the law that they're calling in the hallways of, of the, the Capitol, Harvey's law. Now, there's Kendra's law, there's Jennifer's law. Those are laws to protect people. But in the United States of America, if we're gonna start having laws to attack people, we are on the road to the end of the democracy as we know it. And the uh, uh, assembly should be applauded we're pausing and saying we're not doing anything about this now. We are going to look at all of the Molyneux laws. We're going to look at all of the Sandoval laws, and then we will make a decision. No one should misunderstand what took place here. The people who threw 100 plus years of law out the window was not the Court of Appeals. It was the trial judge four years of change ago. It was the appellate division five to nothing, they're the ones who threw 100-year-old precedent out the window, and it was the Court of Appeals who brought sanity back into the equation and said, in the state of New York, we're not going to convict people on rumors, on untested accusations, on accusations that go back decades that have never been reported to anyone. So the Court of Appeals should be commended, and the New York State Assembly should be commended for protecting the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the state of New York. Thank you, everybody. There's a different, a different way of speaking inside the well of the courtroom and here out on the street. So, calling someone a survivor in the court, in the court well, means it's already been determined that they have been violated. And in the courtroom, that only happens after 12 juries find beyond a reasonable doubt that that's happened. So it's inappropriate for someone to call a by complaining witness a survivor, unlike the defendant who is entitled to the presumption of innocence. So until the verdict is rendered that, some, that someone's found guilty, that defendant is innocent. But a complaining witness only becomes a survivor or a victim after a jury says so. And what is your reaction to the judge saying that both sides should not pander to the press? The judge is the boss. Whatever the judge says, that's what I'm going to do. I've never violated any rules of ethics. I've never been accused of doing so. I'm not planning on starting that. How Thank strong you. of a movement is there to counter what the um, legislature in New York possibly could do to codify prior bad acts? I don't know how strong of a movement there is to counter it. To counter it. I do know that the assembly took a look at this and said, wait a minute, you know, this is changing 100 plus years of precedent in the state of New York. We're not just going to push this through because Harvey's law is a politically cool thing to do and they should be complimented. And what is Harvey Weinstein's spirits like? He did give you a thumbs up when he was coming into the courtroom. He's, um, he's a fighter. I mean, Harvey Weinstein has been through a lot, a lot. And in prison, it's a very different world than Mr. Weinstein is used to living, that any of us is used to living. Uh, we all know about the stories of Rikers Island and the, the comforts and lack thereof. Um, he's doing the best he can under the circumstances. It, it's no secret, you know, at the table, all he was asking for is, you know, let's get the fastest date possible, let's get the fastest date possible, which I tried to do based on our, um, our everyone's schedule up there. But he is very much looking for going to trial. Can you share what book he was holding in his lap? Yes, Kubrick. It's the Stanley Kubrick, like, I don't know, it looked like literally a 600 page. It was one of the biggest books I've ever seen. Um, and it's, I believe it's a biography about Stanley Kubrick, the uh, movie director. What is his day to day like? Um, I don't know exactly. I mean, it's, it's regimented. It's dictated to him what time he gets up and what time he goes to sleep. He is under medical care. Uh, you heard the, the judge uh, said he should get medical attention. 
Um, so, I, I mean, I know he interacts with other people who are incarcerated. I know he interacts with the staff over there. And um, he's generally well liked. And lastly, I know that the prosecutors accused you of trying to intimidate witnesses um, against testifying. What is your reaction to that? Do you believe, do you stand by your words? I'm not, I wasn't trying to intimidate anybody. I was just making some statements that we will be thoroughly prepared to go forward. Do you still stand by they were lying? Excuse me? May I have your name and spelling? Sure, Arthur. Yeah. 24. The district attorney of New York County, who assistant district attorney Nicole Blumberg, wrote a letter to the Honorable Curtis Harbor concerning recent out-of-court statements by Harvey Weinstein's defense attorney, Arthur Idala, to the media regarding my client, Mimi Haley, also known as Mary Hill. I have a copy of the district attorney's letter to the court, which the court just addressed in part 81 a few moments ago and i have copies if some of you need them mimi was the key prosecution witness in the prior new york criminal case against harvey weinstein she bravely testified and was cross-examined by the defense based on her testimony under oath and other evidence, the jury decided beyond a reasonable doubt that defendant Weinstein was guilty of criminal sexual assault of Ms. Haley, and the judge sentenced him to 20 years in New York State Prison. Recently, the New York Court of Appeals, highest court in New York, vacated that conviction and the conviction of third-degree rape of another alleged victim, which carried an additional sentence of three years. The New York Court of Appeals then ordered a new trial. The victim of third-degree rape, whom I do not represent, stated that she would testify again. But my client, Mimi, and I held a press conference at which Mimi announced that she had not yet made that important decision regarding testifying. Less than a week later, as indicated in the district attorney's letter, which is now filed and public, the letter to the court, it was just addressed by the court. Mr. Idala, following the court appearance of Mr. Weinstein, made the following statement outside of court to the media, this was a few weeks ago, which the DA included in their letter to the court. Quote, moments after Mr. Weinstein was sentenced, a lawsuit was filed, and she got a significant check from the insurance company. Not from Mr. Weinstein, but from an insurance company. So the first time that she dares and show her face here will be to tell this jury how you lied to this last jury when you said you had no financial interest in the outcome of this case. When moments after the sentencing, you filed a lawsuit and collected a tremendous sum of money. End quote. As noted by the district attorney, in an important footnote to this letter, footnote two, this statement is false. Ms. Haley did file a civil lawsuit against the defendant, but not until December 30th, 2020, nine months after her testimony and eight months after the guilty verdict. The suit which sought compensation for the pain, suffering, and economic injuries caused by defendant's sexual assault was voluntarily dismissed and discontinued with prejudice less than a year later. Ms. Haley did not receive any payment with respect to her lawsuit and instead participated in a civil bankruptcy settlement from a class action lawsuit 
for women who experience sexual misconduct and workplace harassment by the defendant. The district attorney went on to quote Mr. Idala's statement at his press conference about my client, Mimi Haley. Quote, he said, the Mimi Haley count, it's very serious. But as they said, you know the DA's office isn't going to look at her. Isn't going to look at her and see whether she perjured her. Because we believe that she did. We're going to look into that and investigate it. And see if that is something that could be brought up. Her cross-examination will be prepared for months, literally. And we are already starting, I mean, John Esposito, who is the former Manhattan assistant DA. He's already reading the transcripts. We're going to dice it, slice it, and make sure that the jury hears everything. Mr. Weinstein was in court when the, the prosecutor made all of their statements, so he heard it. Uh, he's confident that there's there will be no more complaining witnesses. That is the appropriate term. That's the courtroom term, complaining witnesses. Um, so, you know, he did not seem to be very concerned about that. He knows that he's never done anything like this. And this was all part of a long-term um, plan to get money, and many people in this case got money, including Miss Allred, who I think she got 40% of everybody who she represented. So I know she's here as a victim's advocate, and unlike our office that represented Bridget Harris totally pro bono and laid money out to really do justice and not take a penny, I don't believe that's the same cloth that which Miss Allred is cut from, but you know, she, everybody puts their head on the pillow and sleeps as soundly as their conscience allows them to. And can you please address Alvin Bragg in the courts um letter that said that uh, what you had said about Ms. Allred's client had a chilling effect on potential witnesses and you should apologize to her client. Um, I don't believe the judge ever said anything about apologies. I don't believe the prosecutor ever said anything about apologies. So I am not going to apologize. The judge said what he wanted to say, what he needed to say, and I, of course I'm going to respect his decision and, and take it from there. They, what they asked for in the letter was to uh, remind uh, the, the, our firm of our ethical obligations. And in 32 years, I've never needed to be reminded of my ethical obligations. Uh, each and every member of our law firm re are reminded of those obligations every single day since we took uh, the oath. So um, 